My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? And this is Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, and Jesus says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, this morning I ask that we would be those who understand why it is so important for us to pray for those around us, that we would reflect the goodness of the God who has adopted us and called us to himself, and that we as your children would reflect the great goodness of who you are, that you would be glorified as we learn to live in joy and the freedom we get by understanding our own forgiveness. Amen. Have a seat. All right, so we are doing this series on Tim Keller's book called Forgive. We have one week left after this week. And as I am telling you, I am freely plagiarizing all the good bits out of this book. So if you buy the book and you read it and you go, oh, I told you up front, don't get all offended, forgive. All right. Uh, <laughs> As I keep saying, if you miss a week, please either subscribe to the podcast and listen to it, watch the YouTube video of the previous weeks, because each of these weeks, they really do go together. They really do. Each week will stand on its own, but if you listen to it as a whole, it really kind of just goes together. Uh, there, are, there are links, as I said, to all the stuff that we are doing in that YouVersion app. Uh, if you don't know how to get a podcast on your phone, talk to Sarah at the Welcome Center. She will show you how to get that up on your phone. And really, we keep coming back back to this question now of how do we forgive those who wrong us? Last week we did talk about repentance. When we wrong others, what do we do with that? Uh, we talked about true and false guilt. My gospel community had this thing about knowing the difference between true and false guilt. They said true guilt is like murder and stealing and things like that. They said false guilt is when I make fun of country music and tell you it's a sin to listen to it. They said that's false guilt. Stop putting that on us. They're on your side for some reason. I don't know why. Okay, so, but we're coming back to this thing again of how do we forgive those who have wronged us? And I think we think we know how to do this, but then when I watch our lives, I think we don't really know how to do this by the way that all of our relationships kind of stagnate. It shows we really don't know what real forgiveness is. Now, Keller throughout the book keeps coming back to Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. We've talked about this numerous times. And Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. And essentially, Jesus says his people are to be those who offer perpetual forgiveness. And when we hear these words, we think, that is impossible. How am I going to do that? And Jesus' disciples, they actually respond the exact same way. They say, if we're supposed to do this, you are going to have to increase our faith because this sounds impossible. But it's not impossible because we have the strength of seeing what God has first done for us that leads us to be able to live in this reality. So we must go back to what we talk about the previous nine weeks, and we must understand our own forgiveness first. Now, Keller looks, talks about how it sounds kind of counterintuitive because it starts with pay attention to yourselves, and then he goes on to talk about forgiveness of others. Like when somebody hurts you or does something to you, it, you pay a whole lot of attention to them, right? What they did, what, what they are doing. And yet Jesus says, pay attention to yourself. I think he's saying when somebody wrongs you, that's when we need to be looking really closely at ourselves and our response because it is way too easy to develop an unforgiving spirit that does not even notice the hardness of our own hearts. It is easy to say when someone is standing in front of you saying, oh, I'm so sorry to say, oh, it's okay. It's not a big deal. But really, we start to become bitter inside sometimes and we don't acknowledge it to anybody else and maybe even ourselves till we kind of fall over the edge of unforgiveness. Jesus says to those who have been wronged, pay attention to yourselves. Assume that you might be more resentful and less forgiving than you want to admit. We have a tendency to be controlled by what other people have done to us. And so he says, pay attention to yourself. Jesus is calling us to deliberately forgive, but not on our own, to forgive in the strength that he offers. Now, our modern world, we have this word that's called wrath. Now, our modern word wrath comes from this word for wreath, like a Christmas wreath, like it's tied together and twisted in, on, upon itself. Well, that's kind of what happens when our anger begins to reshape us into something else. That same word also brings out this word called 
wraith. Uh, wraith, if you love like fantasy or Lord of the Rings, you're going to love this word because that is where an old spirit can't rest. It just runs around in mythology where something was done to you and it can't get over it, so it just stays there and haunts that place. Ooh, it all kind of relates. If we don't deal with our wrath through forgiveness, wrath can turn us into a wraith where we slowly turn over this restless anger inside of ourselves and it twists us so we are controlled by the past. We essentially become haunted. Take American Paratine in 2023, if you will, okay? Uh, a lot of people, and I mean a lot, resent how their parents raise them. I met some of your parents. I get it. I get it. Uh, my mom, now I'm not saying my mom raised me wrong. I thought my mom did the best that she could. But my mom thought the best way to stop me from being a spaz was to spank me. And I got spanked a lot. There'd be times where she would say, do you want to go to the grocery store? And I would say, no, I don't want to the grocery store. Because if I go to the grocery store, I'm going to get my hands on something. Something's going to break and I'll get a spanking when I go home. Do you want to the grocery store? I say, no, I don't want to go. She's going anyway. Well, why ask? So I go to the grocery store. <laughs> And, and I, something breaks, she takes me home, are you gonna get a spank when you get home? I'm like, I knew it, I knew it, that's why I didn't wanna go. So this one time I get home and I put on 10 pairs of underwear. I don't know why, because she can't aim anyway, but she, so I got 10 pairs and she goes, you're gonna wear those all day long. She didn't spank me, I just have my 10 pairs of underwear. <laughs> I'm not here to pick on my mom, I'm here to pick on yours. Okay, so. <laughs> I don't know if I could have done anything else with me whatsoever, but if you have deep-rooted anger at your parents and cannot forgive them for certain things, again, if you're new today, that doesn't mean you let people off the hook for abuse, but if we don't learn to forgive and forgive well, it's gonna distort our relationships with really all authority figures. And then if you have your own children, you may overcompensate by doing more or the opposite of what your parents did to you. And you may end up in a place where you don't parent your children according to their needs, but according to your own felt needs. What does Jesus say? Pay attention to yourself. Pay attention to what is going on in your life. How do we keep all this from turning us into wraiths controlled by the past? Well, we must learn to forgive and forgive well. So we're going to talk about three things in this, and we've talked about these a little bit throughout this series. And when I give you each of these, you're going to kind of freak out a little bit like, oh, I can't believe. Let's just walk through each one. So forgiving well, first off, means we're going to identify with the wrongdoer. Now, identifying with the wrongdoer doesn't mean if they murdered five people, you got to go murder five people so you can identify. That's not what it means. Jesus says, if your brother, and brother means brother or sister, sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Now, some people have said that what Jesus is saying here is if someone doesn't repent, you don't have to forgive them. But that's not what he's saying. Mark 11, 25, we looked at it a couple weeks ago. Jesus says, if you're praying and you realize you have something against someone else, you must forgive them in the moment. Real forgiveness, what it does is it hopes for a full restoration between the offender and Christ. We want to see that repentance, that relationship that comes together. The relationship with you might take longer to repair, but Jesus' meaning is that a brother is still a brother, and a sister is still a sister, and a parent is still a parent, and a neighbor is still a neighbor, and we must love our neighbor like we love ourselves. When someone wrongs us, our hearts naturally want to change that motive of that person in their heart to some malevolent evil, and that may not have actually been their intent. When someone lies, we say, oh, well, they're just a liar. Uh, that's where liars go. You know where liars go. Liars are just terrible. But if we're caught in a lie and someone catches, we have an excuse. Oh, it's complicated. Oh, I didn't mean this. Well, yeah, you did because you lied. But you think you are basically a good person while that other person is not. When we sin, we want mercy. When others sin against us, we want judgment. And that leads to self-righteousness. And self-righteousness in our hearts is deadly. We must remember that we have all been people that need God's grace in our lives. We all need His forgiveness. We must identify with the wrongdoer in that regard. Lewis Smedes writes this, Resentment is bitter, bittersweet. If we did not cherish it, we would let it go. What sort of rewards do we get from our resentment? Why do we keep score? First, it makes us feel superior to the person we resent. Also, we enjoy the feeling of hurt that the memory kindles. We feel noble and worthy as the decent person who was wrongly hurt. Resentments serve a double purpose. They give us a treasured pain, and they give us a chance to justify ourselves. Yet it depresses us, robs us of gratitude, sneaks into other relationships. Jesus says, pay attention 
to yourselves. If we don't see that we ourselves have been sinful and that we ourselves need grace, our resentment will twist and defile us. Miroslav Volf wrote, wrote this, Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans, even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. When one knows that God's love is greater than all sin, one is free to see oneself and so rediscover one's own sinfulness. When you understand God's love for you, you don't hide from your sin. You lay it bare before Him. We understand who we are. So the first part of forgiving well is we come to a place where we identify with the wrongdoer. The second thing in forgiving well is inwardly paying down the debt of the wrongdoer rather than making them pay for it. Now, again, you're probably going, what, what does that mean? Well, let's talk about this. I told you in week three that to forgive means to cancel or remit a debt. To remit something is to refuse to make someone pay who owes you. You're going to assume the cost yourself. Now, Keller says that this is the heart of the Christian meaning of forgiveness. When we are wrong, the perpetrator owes us something. There is a debt. This could be figurative or literal. I told you about a couple of years ago, I'm in the Albertsons parking lot. This guy slams into the back of my truck. Didn't really hurt my truck, really messed up his car, but I did get a dent and I let him go. I said, no, it, it's okay. Even though I let him go, I absorbed the cost of the dent and the debt. I did that. Either he bore it or I did. And this is true if the wrong is not something that can't be measured financially. The cost may be reputation. It could be relationship. It could be health. Forgiving means we deny ourselves revenge. We absorb the cost to not exact a repayment by inflicting on them the things that they did to us. We're not trying to, quote unquote, even the score. And again, this doesn't mean this, if there's abuse, you let someone get away with it. But it means we're not looking for vengeance if we have to call the cops and the cops haul them away. Forgiveness always becomes expensive to the one who is forgiving. But the benefits, according to Jesus, outweigh the cost. And this is what he proved in himself. Forgiveness is inwardly giving up that desire that I have to get revenge. When you forgive, you say to be able to look at a perpetrator and you give them a gift they don't deserve. The Forgive book even says that. It says to forgive is to give the perpetrator a gift that they do not in any way deserve. Forgiveness almost becomes this voluntary sort of suffering on our part that brings about a greater good. And it's possible to seek justice without revenge being in the middle of it. So when you see a perpetrator receive justice, that could be very satisfying to you. But we still want to learn how to forgive before the wrongdoer, how we even know how they're going to respond or whether we will ever see justice done in this life. When we say paying the debt of the wrongdoer, it is so misunderstood in our culture. I almost changed the wording of it so that you're like, what does that mean? But I didn't. I think it's really important to understand this. Most Christians, we have done great damage by not understanding forgiveness and by just saying, oh, think nothing of it, or, or it's not a problem. We're out really dealing with the issue, and we have to deal with the issue. So let's see if this can help. This is on the back part of your notes. I'll give you things here. Forgiveness is not, number one, excusing. Forgiveness is not excusing. Sometimes a perpetrator can give an explanation for the reasons that they did what they did, and you can accept that, and you can excuse that, but that's not forgiveness. That is determining there's just no real debt in the first place. Okay? Forgiveness is not denying or whitewashing. Forgiveness is not pretending a sin is not a sin. Forgiveness starts by taking a full measure of the debt and the cost. Killer were right. The price cannot be paid unless it is reckoned. That means whether it's understood. The third thing, forgiveness is not only refraining from active revenge. Okay, well, I'm not going to burn your house down and slash your tires, therefore I must forgive you. No, if you're just cold and you root for someone's failure, that's the exact same thing. Forgiveness is not suspending judgment. Like someone hurts you and you're like, okay, I'll forgive you this time, but next time I am not going to be so nice. Because what you're saying is, I'm keeping score. I'm keeping score. You're on probation. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is not weaponizing mercy. Oh, look how great I am. I forgave you. I must be so wonderful and you're so terrible. You're going to owe me. That's a form of revenge. Forgiveness is not abandoning justice. Justice is pursued for God's sake, for maybe potential future victim's sake, and even for the perpetrator's sake. It is never loving to allow someone to go on sinning in a grievous way. Personal revenge isn't justice, but not seeking justice at all also isn't justice. The book says one, in, one is vindictiveness and the other is cowardice. 
Forgiveness is not immediate trust. Forgiveness does not mean that you immediately resume the relationship at the, at the depth that it was before. Until a person shows evidence of true change, trust may not be uh, warranted. And so it's not restored. There are so many churches, to, uh, churches today and different organizations in the world who have restored abusers or even molesters to places of trust and authority because they say, oh, that's what forgiveness entails. That is not what forgiveness entails. It is not. Even Jesus, when Peter denies and sins against him, he didn't just restore Peter. He did a whole conversation with him in John 21. And there are some places where trust can be restored, but the speed at which it occurs depends on the response of the offender to correction. Third thing, how do we forgive well, is it is willing the good of the wrongdoer. Now, what does that mean? On the cross, Jesus cries, Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus acknowledges they are sinning against him by killing him, but he also sees their inability to fully understand what they are doing. When we can identify with the wrongdoer, begin the process of inwardly paying down that debt ourselves, we can be freed to will their good. Uh, we do this leadership podcast each week about the message, and Michael asked this question. He goes, what does it mean to will the good? Because it gets kind of hard for us to do that. Keller writes this, a secret to overcoming evil is to see it as something distinct from the evil doer. Our true enemy is the evil in the person. And so we must determine to want their good and their growth and their healing. And that means we begin to start praying for those people. In the end, vengeance is about us. It's not about the honor of God. It is not about the good of victims or the good of the offender. On the other hand, complete withdrawal and not actually going and confronting somebody is about us as well. Many people, when they are wrong, say, I don't want to have anything to do with them. But when someone wrongs you, if you resent them on the inside but stay courteous on the outside, well, that's not being a disciple of Christ. The best way for wanting the good for somebody really comes down to start praying for them when you begin to think about them. The verse I had you stand for, Matthew 5, tells us we love and pray for our enemies just like he did for us. Now, what I want to do right here is I want to, we haven't shown you a forgive video the last couple of weeks. Uh, we had a couple of side excursions and last week we read Psalm 51. But here is uh, Steve's forgive story. And when you watch it, Steve is actually, he's going he's to look a little bit stoic, but that's because there is so much emotion inside of him when he tells you his story. So he's trying not to just break down and cry. As he, so he's going to sit like this. And that's because he's really just holding that emotion in. I, I appreciate it because I have a hard time with emotion myself. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, I want you to watch Steve's story. I, it's, it's excellent. Mm -hmm. This series has been a godsend. It uh, has covered a lot of things that I've worked through for many years. Sometimes painful, often reassuring. God is good, and God can make good of all things. Bad things, sometimes. Specifically, the death of my daughter. In 2006, a record snowstorm blizzard event was forecast and she and her mother drove during that storm after we'd been warned to stay in place, shelter in place. As a result of their taking that trip, they got lost in that snowstorm. After two days of being in a car buried in the snow, Brittany ventured out for help and succumbed to hypothermia. It's so much broader. It's not just my ex-wife, but at first it was I cried out to God and came to terms with forgiving Him if I'm even allowed that. Um, but toward my ex-wife, um, I struggled with bad decisions made throughout that six days of search and rescue, and which became recovery for Brittany. And I know it's judgmental, she did a lot of things I would not have done. The biggest of which is letting Brittany leave the car, their only shelter. So I feel sometimes I've forgiven my ex, but when anniversaries of Brittany's death come along or her birthday or other, you know, significant events, it comes flooding in again and through prayer and 
sleepless nights. I pray about it and I thank God for, for forgiving me. Ask God to forgive her and pray that I can forgive her. Like I said though, I, there are times when I think I did, I have forgiven her. But 17 years into it, I, it's still fresh every January. By God's grace, I moved past vengeance and found peace through his word and through his lessons for all the mistakes that were made. That fateful week, I think of all that God has forgiven me for. So often, remember to lay our burdens at the foot of the cross. God is so good that he could give his only son for our forgiveness. That's beyond my comprehension. Willingly give. I begrudgingly give. God is so good. God loves us and he wants the best for us. And we know he can make good of all things. And my life is a testament to that. So Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves. See what's really going on inside of you. When you start to deal through issues of anger, resentment, and pain, in an earlier chapter, uh, Keller talks about Joseph's story. Uh, if, if you don't know Joseph's story, it's found in uh, Genesis 37 to 50. And really, when you look at it, it's a way to kind of examine our own hearts in the midst of this. Um, Joseph is a kid, starts off as, as a tattletelling brat. His brothers sold him into slavery when they couldn't handle him any longer. And I know that's in the Bible, but don't do that to people irritate you because it's still a sin. Uh, and then they tell their dad a wild animal killed him. And they think that's the end of Joseph. Now, meanwhile, Joseph goes, he is sold from one slaver to another, ends up working in this house, gets accused of a crime he did not commit, and he will be thrown in jail. He will spend his 20s in jail. Now, if you don't know this, the, the 20s are the best part, really, almost of your life. It's like your hair grows where it's supposed to, and not out of your nose and out of your ears. You get out of bed and you look left, and you're not like, oh, what, what happened? Oh, I look left. Now I'm, now I'm hurt all day. And the 20s are great. He spends the 20s in jail, forgotten and alone, except he wasn't forgotten by God. And through God's providence, he eventually gets out of jail. He'll become one of the most you know, powerful people in his nation, though he is probably still considered to be a slave. We did this whole series in the book of Genesis on this. If you want to go to our website, you can, you can listen to that. But if you want to open your Bible, open to Genesis chapter 50, first book in the Bible, last chapter. So over the months and years since they betrayed Joseph, they started to believe that God was going to punish them. And then one day... Years later, when Joseph is in his new position, they meet Joseph again. And it looks like judgment day had come upon them. And so they wait for the condemnation, but it does not come. Instead, there is overwhelming tenderness and kindness and affection. Joseph will weep and kiss his brothers. He will take their family and bring them down to where he is living because there's a famine in the land. And so he will take care of them. He restores family. And then years later, after they've been back in family for a while, their dad dies. And their brothers start to think that Joseph only forgave them because of their father. So we are told, Genesis 50, starting in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And then it says this line, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Why? Because Joseph was with his dad. He knows his dad didn't say that, and he knows he already forgave them. He sees their doubt about the forgiveness that he had extended to them, and he, they still don't believe how much he loves them. And I think when we become Christians, we often walk this same path. Because at the beginning of a relationship with Jesus, it's like, we're like kids. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's so wonderful. God's love is great. And yet, it's not too long before we start to live in ways that reveals that our hearts still doubt his love. 
It shows up in the way we try to earn our worth through our overwork or through our legalism or how we continually beat ourselves up internally over our failures or even the way that we tend to not forgive other people because the reality of God's forgiveness is so faint to us. I think Jesus is saddened when we act like that, just like Joseph was grieved when he got his brother's message. Now, Genesis goes on, Genesis 50, verse 19. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. What Joseph does is he restates his forgiveness of them in the vertical forgiveness of God. He grounds the horizontal outward forgiveness of them based firmly in the vertical forgiveness. If we center our lives in our guilt or our shame, we're never going to understand our own forgiveness. We're not going to learn how to forgive others. And this is why you pay attention to yourselves. What are we centering our lives upon? Forgiving well. There's three things you see that Joseph does here and teaches us. First off, we need enough humility to forgive. Enough humility. This goes back to identifying with the wrongdoer. Joseph says, am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? If you sometimes have trouble forgiving someone else, sometimes we forget that we are also sinners, that we are not God. Joseph says, the only way that I could stay unforgiving towards you is if I considered myself worthy to be your judge, but I am not. And the Bible does show that God wants us to cry out in our pain when we're hurt. He hears that, he honors that, but he is the judge of it all. The second thing is that we need enough joy to forgive. We need enough joy to forgive. Joseph says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. In the Hebrew, it literally says, you meant this for evil. He doesn't forgive by glossing over it and saying it's not a big deal. Oh, what you did wasn't so bad. He said, no, you did evil. It was wrong. He speaks the truth. But then he says, yet in spite of that evil deed, I have a God who loves me. And God lifted me up. And he brought me to himself, and he himself has brought joy to my life. He centers it in the vertical, God to him. Evil people do evil things. And we should not do things where we want to stop the rightful expression of our pain. The Bible says those expressions are healthy. They are justified. But we cannot get stuck in those places. God is working out his plan for good in all things. And we can even look at a perpetrator and say, you cannot ultimately harm me. You can't take me out from under God's care and his love. The third thing you see from Joseph is we must be those who learn to repay evil with good. Joseph, or Genesis chapter 50, verse 21, Joseph says, So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. When we forgive, you are not saying, all my anger is gone. Oh, it just all evaporated. What you're saying when you forgive is, I am going to treat you the way that God treated me. That's what I'm going to do. How do we do that? you got to pay attention to yourself. It means I'm not going to act towards you based upon what you did to me. What that means is other people are not the controlling reality of your life. What is the controlling reality? It's the grace of God. That's the controlling reality. And you might look at Joseph and think, oh man, Joseph, he's just amazing. I can never do that. And I got to tell you, Joseph was pretty darn amazing. But when we say that, we forget that we have something Joseph did not. Just like last week, I told you we have something that King David did not. Joseph did not know about Jesus. He didn't know about the cross, the ultimate example of God bringing good out of evil. Do you understand when we understand what the gospel is and the cross, that should make us more humble than Joseph ever was. Because Joseph really didn't understand just how bad we are. Joseph did not realize that God would actually have to die to save him. He did not get that, but it should also make us more confident than Joseph was because we understand Jesus did die for us in our place. Seeing the gospel lets us have this assurance that God means everything for his glory and our good. This means Christians can have a humility and a joy and a confidence that makes forgiveness possible. Carol likes to talk about in, in this book, this resource that we have in understanding the costliness of Jesus' saving love. And there are many people today who recoil from the idea of a judgment day or things like that. But there are ramifications when people reject this idea of God bringing justice upon evil. 
See, how will justice ever be done for all the evil and corruption and violence that has happened in history? Justice will not be done if there is not a divine judgment day. And if there is no judgment day, what hope is there for the world? But there's another implication of this as well, this rejection of God who has wrath against our sin. It minimizes what Jesus did for us. Keller says after a Sunday morning service, a lady walked up to him and she accused him that he was narrow-minded. And I understand this. This has happened to me. I'm like, oh, it's not only me. People, people have this happen too. Uh, she, and so he says, why do you think I'm narrow-minded? And she said this, because this whole idea that you have to believe Jesus died. I believe in a God of pure love who loves everybody no matter what. Jesus didn't have to die. He just loves everyone. And again, there's our cultural definition of love, right? So he says to her, what did it cost your God to love you? And she says, I guess nothing. And he said, if you don't believe in a just God who must punish sin, you do not have a sense of what it costs Jesus to love you. Now, what does that mean? Well, on the cross, Jesus cries out, uh, Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We are all a people who have run from God. We have gone our own way. When God says, uh, do this, and we say, oh, I'm going to do this instead, we have all rebelled. We have all run. We all have this separation. And Jesus takes that separation upon himself, the separation from God that we deserved, not him. This was the ultimate agony, and we don't fully understand this. And when someone says, oh, God just loves everyone, well, in one sense, it's true because he does. But that mindset causes our world to not see God as loving as he is in the Bible. Because he is loving, there is grace for us. Because he is holy, it is an infinitely costly grace. And when we know that we are the recipients of that costly grace, that's what changes us. That's what makes us a people who are humble and confident. It will humble us out of our pride, out of our self-centeredness, and it will really also affirms us out of our inferiority and self-pity. It makes us hate our sins because it led to his death, but it forbids us to hate ourselves because he did it for us to make us free. There is nothing that changes us like the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the announcement of the good news that Jesus came, lived the life we should have lived, died the death we deserve to die. He rose from the grave. He takes our sin upon himself. He gives us his righteousness. He takes our death. He gives us his life. This is what results from the good news of what Jesus did on the cross. And when we understand that, there are no inferiority complexes because we're so loved, but there's also no superiority complexes because we're only saved by grace. Both of these things together, understanding the cry of Jesus on the cross is really that key to personal transformation. It is really the great key to the work of human forgiveness and reconciliation. And I think this is why we must pay attention to ourselves because that's the only way we're going to be able to forgive well. Pay attention. What do you believe about Jesus? Have you twisted the idea of what God's love looks like? Pay attention to yourselves. What do you believe about God's work in the world? What do you believe about God's love? Do you understand that God is holy and good and loving and full of justice at the exact same time? And that God calls us to be a people who then witness of this great restorative saving love to the entire world. Because only so much as we begin to understand that will we be able to live in areas of true forgiveness. Will we ever be able to say, you know what, for the grace of God, I could have done exactly what that person just did to me. And maybe I even did that to other people in the past. We can be those who look at sinful actions and call them sinful, to not overlook them, but also move to a place where we don't have to live in vengeance. We can live in grace. And that can come about because we have a humility and a confidence and a joy because of what God has done. Every week at Element, we bring you to this place of communion as a reminder of what Jesus did. Will we lay down our burdens at his feet and remember his grace and his mercy and his kindness that was given to us. That is why you break the cracker like his body was broken for us. You dip it in the wine or the grape juice. We don't pass communion throughout the room. It's a response to understanding what he has done, to recentering our lives in this place, that there is a humility and a confidence, and a joy as we as a people surrender ourselves to Him as our Lord, as our God, as our King. And our love and our worship of Him will be displayed by how we begin to live in this world with one another. And it will be shown in how we begin to forgive one another. 
This is why. And, you know, Christianity is not something you just get into by osmosis. I was around a while and I guess I fell into this. No, it's a decision that we make. I surrender my life to Christ. I trust you in all things. And he makes us born again, spiritually alive, begins to restore that relationship. And this is the key to beginning that walk with Christ, the surrender of our lives to all that he is. Guys, if, if you need prayer today, maybe you are in a spot where you struggle with ideas of forgiveness, but you've never really understood your forgiveness of God given first to you, that maybe you don't have a confidence and a joy and a humility, and you want someone to pray with you about that, there's going to be people right across the way in the lounge. You can go during music. You can go when service is over. If you have any questions from what I've talked about this morning, they'd love to answer your questions as well. And if they can't answer a question, they'll send you back to me, and I'll do my best to answer the question. But what we want to do is be able to be open and available. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. Uh, Element is a church that doesn't pass an offering plate. What we do is we have offering boxes on the side wall. You can give online. Uh, most people give online. But it's a response to what God is doing in us. When we understand the great generosity of God, it makes us become a generous people as well. And so you can, you can give that way. And I would encourage you to grab those sermon notes, those questions. Uh, talk to one another about them. If you're here with somebody this morning, maybe make a lunch appointment or something like that and walk through those questions. If you're in a gospel community, walk through these questions to get to the place of understanding the, the great uh, understanding of humility and confidence and the joy that we get to have because of what God has done so our lives can reflect the great forgiveness that we have first received. And it is not easy. And, it, and what, what is easy is falling back into the old places of resentment and anger. And again, this is why we pay attention to ourselves. Not in a myopic, look how great I am, but in a way that says, am I truly trusting in Christ in these moments and in these ways? Because I want to be someone who glorifies God in all things. So let's pay attention to ourselves. Let's worship God for who he is and come to the place where all that we are is surrendered to all that He is. So as we live in this world, His people would reflect the great forgiveness of God. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I ask that you would move our hearts to a place that we would understand what the gospel truly means, that we would understand the announcement of your life and death and resurrection, and then we would understand the results and the ramifications of that. It will result in a confidence in you because you came to rescue us. That it will result in a humility because we would understand that you needed to come and rescue us. But it will also result in a joy that is deep and foundational to our lives. That when we are hurt, when things happen that we don't understand or we do understand and we, and we don't like, that there would be a basis of joy that stems from the truth of the gospel that permeates our entire lives. Not a happiness, but a deep foundational understanding that you have loved us and sought us and called us to yourself. And then I ask that you would take that understanding and teach us how to live that outward so that you would be known because of your mercy and grace. As you draw us to yourself, as we begin to understand our own forgiveness, we ask that you would teach us how to forgive and forgive well. And we ask this in your son's good name. Amen.